A related concept to uh, software as a service it is service-oriented architecture. So sometimes in computer science, people make up a term that's really hard to understand and uh, or so general that it applies to everything, uh, and so people don't use it. So service-oriented architecture was almost so general that it almost died, but it actually has a, a, a good meaning. It's not everything is in service-oriented architecture. So kind of the question is here, is there a way that you can design software so that you can recombine all independent modules and create new applications out of it without doing a lot of programming? That's kind of the question. And service-oriented architecture is that idea. All the components are designed to be independent services, like you would go over the internet to access them. That's the idea of service-oriented architecture. So what this means, if everyone's its own service, is if you went over the internet to access it, it's easy to get a replace one, right? One of them is replaceable very easily. It's not going to bring down the service. And it's also recover mistakes from your dimes. You can throw things out and, or put them back together. It's much more flexible. So Armando and I had to come up with a name for the thing that's not service-oriented architecture, and we think it's a software silo. So it's monolithic. It's behind it kind of the way you would traditional do it. There's no APIs that are visible. Everything's internal. And it's kind of the normal way to do it, and we would use this, you know, a grain silo as the acronym. So we had a hard time trying to explain this, and then this thing happened while we're writing the book that was fortuitous. So if you work at companies, there's often inside of companies, there'll be you know, yeah. well-known people who write a lot of email, flame on about how the company's so screwed up, we gotta do this because you know, we're, we're, we're dummies, right? Well, there was a guy at Google who had, used to be an Amazonian, right? He used to work at Amazon. He'd come to Google, was successful at Google for a while, and he had two blogs. He had his internal Google blog where he'd flame about everything that screwed up about Google, and then he had his public blog where he'd say how wonderful Google is, right? And <laughs> alas, one day, probably because he was multitasking, he was probably you know, playing with his phone when he did it, when he posted his Google flame instead of the Google blog, he went to the public one, and the public one said, he probably said really nice things about Google that day. So Armando saw it and he figured it wasn't going to be up for you and he grabbed it <laughs> and saved it. So that's what the next slide is going to be and it's just the best, <laughs> it's the best description of software and servers that we, we've seen. And so it, the person said, supposedly, in think, he thinking internally to Google, uh, he was talking about Jeff Bezos, the founder and CEO of Amazon and he the company was about seven years old at the time when he was been there, and they've been using kind of monolithic software. And so you come to work Monday morning, you get this email from Bezos. And there's seven points here. Six of them he really said, and one this guy added. And so you, I'll tell you which one it is. You open up your email, and it says, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. There will be no other forms of communication. So I didn't want to leave any holes here. <laughs> You've got to do that. No direct linking, no direct reuse of the team data store, no shared model, no backdoors. The only communication is allowed via service interfaces of network. By the way, Bezos has a computer science degree uh, from Princeton. He got a bachelor's degree, so he knew some technical things and he announced it. So these are the first thing things you use. He didn't really care which API you use. You just got to do it. You got to you know, pick your own way of doing sockets or RPC, whatever you want to do, but it's got to be a, a, a network-like interface. Service interfaces without exception must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. That is to say the team must plan and design to be able to expose interfaces to developers to the outside, word, outside world. No exceptions. Okay. Well, he's the CEO of the company, you're a engi software engineer, you've got the best job in the world. Why do I really have to do what Bezos says, right? Well, the next line clarified that. Anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. <laughs> so that was relatively clear. And then the seventh point is, thank you, have a nice day. Uh, Bezos wouldn't have said the last thing. He would, the, la the end of the email was, if you don't do this, you'll be fired, right? So that's how he got the attention of the software engineers at Amazon. And they did transform you know, a pretty successful company that was using monolithic software to be using uh, uh, service-oriented architecture. The same thing, interestingly, happened at Facebook. It doesn't have quite the dramatic uh, uh, story here, but three years, they'd had monolithic software three years into it. 
they decided to go ahead and go to a service-oriented architecture. And if you were using Facebook at the time, you're reading the New York Times on your, on your computer, and suddenly there's some notice that other, your friends are also reading that same article than you. And they did that by what was called the Facebook platform. So to make this clearer, let's give an example. Suppose we're going to do a bookstore, and we'll show it siloed and service-oriented architecture version. Uh, so in this particular example, and uh, yeah, that, that works. So we have three databases, reviews, users, and orders, and so then we have uh, these different services. The review subsystem has to talk to reviews and users. The user profile is just with users, and the buying subsystem is with orders and users. So you build this thing as a monolithic interface, internal uh, calling and stuff like that. You provide this single interface to the outside, the bookstore service, and people use it. So that's a monolithic approach. The service-oriented approach has a lot of the same components, but these are now services. So user reviews, the review service has editor and user reviews, the user profile service, the buying service, and you can combine those together to get the bookstore service just like we had before. So that's it's a little bit more overhead. You pay the network overhead of providing the service, but it works. Well, what's nice about this, we could easily add credit card processing. If maybe it wasn't there before, you get that service someone else and plug it in. And you could create a brand new service, uh, Favorite Books, that you just use these two pieces to create and tie them into social networking. And then you could, your friends can book services. So that's the idea of service-oriented architecture. <clears throat> 